Our social life really gravitated around Alert Bay. Alert Bay was the only community, for example, that had the Dixieland Band in it, and that sounds kind of crazy, but it was a big enough community that it could actually have enough people and attract people who could play musical instruments. The doctor at Alert Bay was a, a very good jazz piano player. He was especially good at Fats Waller-style piano playing. And he heard that there was a trombone player in Port McNeil, myself, and he sent a message to me to come to Alert Bay because he happened to have a trombone in his house that he had bought from some guy who was short of money. And so I went to Alert Bay, took his trombone, sat in with their band, and I became a, a trombone player in the Dixieland band in Alert Bay. I had sold my trombone when I left England to help to pay for my ticket to North America. I first came to Alert Bay in the late 50s. When that, that's when I first met Gilbert. And I used to play at in, in a band at the community hall. And Gilbert used to come in from, from logging. Uh, Gilbert was a phenomenal dancer. He loved to dance. And the girls all loved to dance with him. And that was my first encounter with Gilbert and, and, and dancing because I also loved to dance and I used to play the piano and, and they would say take a break Maxine and so I would go down and, and dance and that was, that was many many years ago. Alert Bay was ideally suited to run a regatta. We didn't have enough people in Port McNeil or Port Hardy or Port Alice to run something. Alert Bay was a center of population for everybody it was possible for them to organize with the native people because the native people were some, some really good sportsmen among the natives, soccer players in particular, and people who were really good at boats, not sailing, but power boats, paddling. So Gilbert and his crew created this regatta, and they invited all the municipal councils, the other three, to participate, and Port McNeil has always participated in the regatta, and we could never win anything because Gilbert had total control of the people who actually kept account of the various points, and so Port McNeil was usually at the very end of the winners. It wasn't a winner, it was a loser every time, but there was enough beer distributed at Alert Bay to drown our sorrows. So we. We never actually, we, we weren't hurt by it. We, we accepted the job of low man on the totem pole. We had lots of fun. We drank a fair amount of beer with the, our friends in Alert Bay. And generally, we helped to civilize that community. We used to have them all come, and we used to have uh, eats and drinks before we went. And uh, then we would get into the boats and uh, and row around a buoy in the in the island. Uh, we'd have 
pistols, uh, water pistols, and uh, and buckets and things, and throw water at each other, and uh, it was just a, a lot of fun. And this cup that was made by the Public Works Department, it was a very uh, simple cup made of a piece of an engine with a, a few things stuck on it, and uh, but it became very very valued in the North Island because everyone wanted the Alert Bay Cup and it took us years before we finally won it, Alert Bay finally won the cup. But normally when someone won the cup it, it got stolen during the day because after the race we'd go back to the hall and, uh, and toast the winners uh, most of the afternoon and uh, so it was a very good social event and all the politicians I uh, used to enjoy that, and that was Gilbert's idea. And we uh, socialized. Uh, we, we had dinners at his house. Uh, uh, we got together at the Canadian Legion. Uh, uh, Gilbert was, uh, I think, a member of the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. Yeah, and I, I too, was uh, uh, spent some time in the Royal Canadian Air Force, so we had that in common. We had a lot of movie stars come through here on tour boats. Um, um, millionaires came through here, and he made friends with all of them. It didn't matter um, what you had in your pocket or what your residence was. It was what was in your head and what was in your heart is what made friends for him. We got to know each other quite well. I used to go around to his house for one of his, his famous Italian dinners that he used to cook, except Margie, his wife, usually ended up cooking most of it while he sat and uh, had his favorite glass of vino, and uh, we would talk. And uh, at that time, I was a school teacher, and I used to actually teach some of his, uh, two of his children, and uh, we used to talk about them as well. So. And uh, Margie, his wife, and my wife became good friends too, and, and still are. I enjoyed cooking. Um, Gilbert was always like, why don't you cook this or why don't you cook that? So I said, why don't you cook it? I said, you remember what your mother cooked. You remember what it tasted like. So you, that's the only way you're going to learn. You have to go to the stove, and they were um, practicing some bad dinners, um, but he learned how to do it, and he was very good at it. And I think it was a total of five dishes that he learned how to cook very well. And then, so then he started taking credit to what I could do. And he's going, oh, I taught her how to do this. Or, oh, yeah, I taught her how to do that. And that was the politician in him. But we did have a lot of people, and he was very good at it. And I have never tried to cook polenta or risotto. or. But he liked being around the house. He liked being out in the yard and whether he was cutting grass or building a wall or... Um, or cooking. Every time we moved, he always made sure that he had a little garden where he could plant his vegetables. Or, I mean, one year he grew artichoke, and just like we were all amazed. We never thought it would grow here, but he loved his vegetables and he loved to try and grow fruit trees or raspberry bushes or. He was good at it. He was patient. It, what it was, was that it turned off his mind from the political view. It was his way of relaxing, to just putter in his yard and nobody call him or, you know, um, and it would shut down his mind. And so he relaxed and regained his energy. Oh yeah, yeah. He he had uh, all those current bushes down there. The the person that took over has hasn't been keeping it up, but there was a whole bunch of current brush bushes, and he grew 
uh, vegetables, all kinds of vegetables he grew. Yeah. So yeah, he was a keen gardener, and he liked animals too. <laughs> they used to go out with him in the garden. Yeah. In fact, the cat we've got used to live over there. And when Margie moved to her new house, because you know she used to live over there, when she moved to her new house, uh, the cat kept coming back, wouldn't go with her. She took it there and he'd get out and he'd, like her house is, you know where the school is? It's like down, quite a ways away. And he would show up at, at the door. He wouldn't go, wouldn't stay. So eventually we got stuck with it. <laughs> But my wife loves cats, so that's fine. I'm, I'm not what you'd call a cat lover, but I tolerate them, <laughs> and they tolerate me. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, but Gilbert really liked, loved animals. We used to go out fishing with his, uh, his father-in-law, Margie's dad, and uh, Gilbert uh, took the dog, and the dog used to sit up at the front of the boat, and like this enjoy being on the boat. We weren't very good, but, but we enjoyed it. We'd take a case of beer <laughs> and sit out there and, and fish and, and talk. Yeah, it was good. We'd, we'd catch the odd one, but that wasn't uh, the main reason we went. We just wanted to enjoy our, our company. <laughs> Radar was a huge, big dog he was he stood he was I, I think he was an Irish uh, wolfhound and he did he stood very high radar used to come to my house and because he, he I had two little dogs he loved my dogs and radar used to come he was tall enough I had the butter sitting up on my counter and I saw radar he had come to visit and say hello and so he I saw him moseying off down the road with a pound of butter that he had stolen from me. And that was Gilbert's dog. <laughs> anyway, with, with, we, had, we had a strict bylaw about dogs. Dogs must be on a leash. Radar what didn't, didn't have to be on a leash. And everybody used to say, why does Gilbert, because it's the mayor's dog. Radar used to go from one place to the other and he would get something to eat see from you and he would come to the the store next door and he would and he would come to my restaurant and we always had something for radar he was a he was a good old dog and when radar was sick and we were at a municipal convention uh gilbert disappeared so i said to somebody where did gilbert go and they said oh he went home because because radar was was dying was was ill so gilbert it was pretty sad he came he came home to look after his dog. My fondest memory of my dad is his great love for animals, and I think I, I got that from him. I remember as a little girl bringing home these stray cats, while well, I called them stray, but I think I just found them in people's yards, and I would bring them home and say, Dad, Dad, please, can I please keep this cat? And uh, he would say no, but I would cat, he would say no, but then I would catch him petting the cat and, and eventually falling in love. We always had tons of cats, Tons and tons of cats and dogs. We had, uh, he always, we always had pets. Yeah. Yeah, Gilbert loved most animals, dogs and cats, and uh, except for mice. And uh, he had this thing about mice that terrified him. It was quite funny. On one occasion, he's reported to have uh, called some friends to come to his house because he was, there was a rat in the house. And so he, uh, when his friends arrived, the, Gilbert was standing on a chair in the corner of the kitchen with a broom in his hand, um, screaming, Ratha, Ratha, there's a rat in the house, I've got to get rid of the rat. And so his friends helped get that rat out of the house, and thereafter Gilbert uh, bought cases and cases and cases of rat poison and, so, and put sign up, signs up saying... Uh, Anybody who has a rat problem, you can come to the village office and get a box of rat poison. So they, uh, in a funny article in the newspaper, in the Gazette newspaper, they kind of referred to him as the, the Pied Piper of Alert Bay. Not the Pied Piper of Hamlin, but the Pied Piper of Alert Bay. 
So yeah, he was bound and determined. He's, he thought that living on an island, we should be able to have a rat-free environment, um, in spite of the fact that ships come and tie up to the dock and the rats come off the boat. <laughs> um, we still have rats. And because of his nature, we love to tease him constantly. You know, if, you're, if somebody is poking you all the time, then you've got to poke back and just to, to keep him on his toes. So you would tease him in this thing I was showing you before as a, an imitation of the uh, newspaper, the, the local newspaper. And the headline is, Alert Bay Mayor Linked to Sicilian Mob Family and uh, threatened to have to step down from his job as mayor. And the whole article is just totally tongue-in-cheek and uh, making fun of him. Uh, just to get him mad. And it worked. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> but, yeah. And always in... Even the argument was in good humor, you know, or a good, uh, good spirit. But he was a debater, a very strong, strong debater. Uh, through the years that I knew Gilbert, over 30 years, uh, he also got to meet uh, my family, my mum and dad and sister and brother, and uh, they all knew him quite well. And when he died, we decided that we should have some permanent memorial for him, and so what better thing to have was a bench in the park that uh, he actually was instrumental in building a boardwalk through the ecological park in Alert Bay. And so we decided that we'd have a bench erected here in his honor and as a memorial, a permanent memorial for his memory. And uh, we're very proud of that fact. He did fly planes uh, when he was in Alert Bay also. And I think he was in part ownership with a, with another person. I think they had a plane between the two of them. and, and uh, with, it. But if he flew planes like he drove buses, I don't think I really would have wanted to, to have flown with him. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> and the way that he would, he would drive, he drove like just... just crazy with he and and you pretty well took your life in your hands when you went with him anywhere we would go to some of these municipal conventions and I would catch a ride with Gilbert and you were just you were it was just a, it was a hair raising experience driving with him I think most likely used to driving in in uh, in Italy the way that they drive there <laughs> when he used to drive the bus for me um, because he was stubborn and figured he knew everything uh, he I would say to him Gilbert we need to take the bus out on a, to practice because we're going to have all these we have 2,000 people coming in you know tomorrow and uh, we'll have to we've got to practice as to where we're going to take these people on the bus and he would say no, 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 everything's fine. No, 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 Maxine, he'd say. No, no, no. Anyway, when the first time that we got the people on the bus, he couldn't figure out how to to shut the bus doors, and the bus doors kept opening and shutting and opening and shutting. And I just thought if I had been a passenger on that bus, I would have got off right then. And the second thing that he did, he backed up the bus and he backed it straight into a great huge telephone pole and it went crash. And the third thing that he did was he drove it in an area where I told him not to drive and he, drew, and he tore off all the skirting off of, on, on, off of the one side of the bus, all the underside part of the bus. And the worst things that he did, he would get more and more excited and he would sound, and he would speak more and more in Italian and more and more and more. And it was quite funny. So people used to write articles about being driven around Alert Bay by the mayor of Alert Bay and the deputy mayor. <laughs> it was just, oh, just funny. <laughs> Flat screen TV. God damn it, John. And a third, an iPad. <laughs> you can give that as a, as a Write present. Write my name down there. It's not yours. A present. <laughs> you haven't got a pen. No, That's no. too bad. Put it away. Too late. <laughs> too late. <laughs> <laughs> it started uh, in a way to get get away from the wife and get out of the house. I guess it, uh, you could put it that way. And we... Uh, 
used to used to go out and and look at a tree and a few times, and then go to the pub, and have a few beers, and then eventually we'd cut the tree down, and then we'd uh, chop it up and take it home for firewood. And this is the way we <laughs> sort of got, got out of got out of the house and have a few beers. And of course, it's really, really hard work chopping down trees, <laughs> and it is sweaty, and we were thirsty, and so actually we had to have some kind of liquid refreshment, and uh, it always seemed to turn out to be beer, and that's what we uh, used to do. And then we kind of, uh, like, expanded. Uh, people wanted to join the Loggers Club because they had so much fun and so on. And so we had actually members from all over all over the world. We had members from France, Hong Kong, from Hong Kong. We even had a guy pay in yen. He paid uh, uh, our uh, initiation fee was uh, fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. Yeah. And he gave us how many yen? Uh, about a thousand, <laughs> <laughs> a thousand yen. But uh, the fifty dollars was the application fee, but it was non-refundable. Uh, you couldn't get it back if you weren't successful. And one of the stipulations was that you had to have your wife or your partner to sign the form saying that they agreed for you to become a member. And uh, if they didn't sign the form, then of course you weren't allowed. But it was only for men. We're only men. We didn't have any women. Wouldn't, women weren't allowed in the logos. Except department. for our secretary. We had a, a secretary once. 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 We kept their meet, kept the minutes. Yeah. And uh, she did that for about five or six times until we got to read the minutes and we decided that was the good idea. <laughs> That's right. He, Dennis, and I were founding members. And uh, we took part on being the president or the chairman, as it were. But we never had any written agendas. Just who was going to buy the next jug. Right. <laughs> We used to uh, go to the Nipkish Hotel, which is the, the pub down on the, on the main road, and uh, we had this little fly, little and, fly. The, uh, and, uh, and the bartender came and he spilled some beer on the table, and this little fly, he got in there and he got drunk. <laughs> So we we uh, we sort of adopted him, and we gave him a name. His name was Hemlock, <laughs> which is appropriate because it was a logging club, right? Hemlock, and uh, Hemlock. Uh, we adopted him, and we were watching Hemlock. And then the bartender came in with another jug of beer, and he put it down on the table, and he killed Hemlock. Killed Hemlock. <laughs> so every July the thirteenth. Which is when it happened. We have we have a ceremony for hemlock <laughs> at the loggers club. Talking about a bunch of nuts. Eh? <laughs> Gilbert, he was the only logger among a lot of us. He did work in the bush, eh? Before oh yeah. He, uh, before he came over over to the little bay. Yeah, he was a prop like a logger. He used to climb up the trees and. Chopped the branches, and uh, he was telling a story that uh, he almost killed himself once because uh, he had the chain around and he had it around a branch that uh, that he didn't realize it was uh, it was if he cut that branch he would fall, and it almost happened. And someone yelled up, "Don't do that!" And I guess he didn't, so he survived. So he was kind of lucky. When he was driving taxi, our taxi company used to uh, also operate the ambulance service. And they had a van that they used as, as the ambulance. And so this lady would say that she was ill, she had to go to the hospital. And so Gilbert would have to go and, to, and p pick her up. It was just because she wanted to see him. And one day somebody phoned and said that she needed to be taken to the hospital, and Gilbert thought, oh no, anyway, so he went in to pick her up, and she had died. 
and he had, he was all by himself and so he had to he had to get her um this this her body from the house because there was nobody to help him into this van which was the ambulance onto a stretcher anyway get get her into the ambulance and took her to the hospital where they were very very busy at the hospital and said oh she's died you'll have to take her to the morgue to be put on a on a slab in the morgue keep her cool anyway so and, and there was nobody again to help him so he got they got her on this stretcher and he took he took her to the to the morgue and um was putting her on the pull-out trays that they had in there for the bodies, and the bo and and the tray came off the rollers and pinned Gilbert in between the lady who really had a crush on him, who really liked him, and uh, and and the and the floor, and there, there he lay because there was nobody ever that nobody came for about maybe two hours. I always say she she definitely had the last laugh when. But, and she had Gilbert exactly where she'd always wanted to get him. But be, be, <laughs> she was, was, that was a, one of the funny stories that I always remember about, about Gilbert. Mm -hmm.